Thanks everyone to join webinar. It was created especially for students who are interested in IT careers and want to learn the first steps on how to move in the direction and get jobs such as data science, software engineer, full stack developers, artificial intelligence engineer, and so on. Let me introduce myself. My name is Olga Karnienka and I'm head of student talent recruitment at Constructor Knowledge and Constructor University. Yeah, this is uh, the first webinar from the series of webinars which we will have together with JetBrains. It's organized by Constructor University located in Germany, ranked in top 25% of universities worldwide according to the Times Higher Education ranking. And also this series of webinars will be organized in collaboration with our partner JetBrains, a global software company and leading tool provider for developers. During these webinars, we will explain different topics. We will dive deep into different aspects of IT in real life. There will be detailed presentation of our bachelor program, which was designed together with Constructor University and JetBrains. Uh, also, there will be sessions on students' life, how to apply and uh, what financial options we have and what scholarships we have. Some presentation will include feedback from our current students. And today's agenda is Application of Artificial Intelligence in Real Life, which will be presented by Suhail Yusuf, lecturer in Computer Science at Constructor University. Professor Dr. Alexander Amelchenko, Dean of School of Computer Science and Engineering at Constructor University, will present more information about bachelors in software, data, and technology. I will explain more about admission process, financing options, and scholarships. And at the end, we will have a Q&A section. Also, you can ask your questions right now in YouTube chat. So join us. Thank you for waiting. And sorry, one more time for the delay. And let me ask Suhail to join our session and to tell more about applications of artificial intelligence in real life. Suhail, are you here? Yes. Uh, yeah. Thank you, Olga. Um, next slide, please. Um, Good evening, everybody. Uh, I'm Dr. Suhail Yusuf. Um, currently, I am a lecturer in computer science at Constructor University. Um, I'm teaching uh, courses related to programming uh, and distributed systems. Um, my research activities, um, since I have recently started, so I have, uh, it's a new area um, that is related to marine robotics. Uh, but of course, it lies in the domain of artificial intelligence. Uh, in uh, my past, uh, not so, uh, so it's a recent past in uh, Pakistan. Uh, I belong to Pakistan. So before joining Constructor University, I was serving as assistant professor at University of Engineering and Technology, Peshawar. Uh, I have more than 15 years of teaching experience. Uh, I was also a principal investigator uh, at National Center of Artificial Intelligence uh, in Pakistan. Um, uh, besides that, I'm co-founder of a software development company named uh, Techies Solutions um, Private Limited. Next, please. So today I will uh, be talking about uh, Earthquake Early Warning System. Uh, is an application of artificial intelligence and Internet of Things. Uh, it is basically a project that I recently completed as a principal investigator. Next, please. So earthquakes um, is natural disasters resulting from the sudden release of energy within uh, Earth's crust can lead to various destructive effects, uh, posing significant threats to both property and human lives. So the primary factors contributing to the devastation caused by earthquakes are landslides, tsunamis, fires, and fault uh, ruptures. So one of the destructive consequences of earthquakes is uh, triggering of landslides. So the intense ground shaking uh, during an earthquake can uh, dislodge rocks and soil from hillsides, leading to mass movements uh, that can bury structures, obstruct roadways, and result in severe environmental changes. Tsunamis, so the earthquakes occurring beneath the ocean, 
uh, floor can generate tsunamis, large ocean waves capable of causing widespread coastal damage. The abrupt uh, vertical movement of the Earth's crust uh, displaces water, creating powerful waves uh, that may inundate uh, coastal areas, causing flooding and destruction. Similarly, fires. So fires represent a significant uh, secondary uh, effect of earthquakes. The violent shaking can rupture gas lines, ignite electrical sparks, and overrun flammable materials, leading to widespread fires. So fire storms can engulf communities, uh, exacerbating the destruction caused by the initial earthquake in complicating rescue and recovery efforts. Similarly, uh, fault rupture. So fault rupture occurs uh, when stress accumulated along a geological fault is released during an earthquake, causing the ground to uh, break and shift. So this movement can result in surface displacement and uh, damage to infrastructure built across fault lines. So despite these uh, primary effects, the specific damage uh, caused by earthquakes manifests through uh, various mechanisms. For example, ground shaking. So the violent shaking of ground is the primary contributor to property losses and personal injuries during earthquakes. It can cause buildings, bridges, and other structures to sway, crack, or collapse, uh, leading to devastating consequences for communities. Ground rupture. So ground rupture involves the visible displacement of the Earth's surface uh, along a fault line. So this can lead to uh, the formation of surface ruptures, damaging roads, pipelines, and other linear structures uh, built across the fault zone. Liquefaction. So liquefaction occurs in saturated soils during an earthquake, transforming solid ground into liquid-like state. This phenomenon can compromise the stability of structures built on our near liquefiable soils, causing them to sink or tilt. So while each of these factors contributes to the overall damage caused by earthquakes, the secondary effect of fires uh, often proves to be more uh, impactful. So the combination of uh, ruptured gas lines, electrical malfunctions, and debris triggered ignition can result in uh, widespread fires, compounding the destruction and hindering recovery efforts uh, in the aftermath of seismic events. So uh, understanding and mitigating the various dis destructive effects of earthquakes are crucial for minimizing the potential impact on uh, both communities and the environment. Next, please. So uh, earthquakes in Pakistan, um, of course, earthquakes are there everywhere uh, on Earth, um, but uh, particularly in Pakistan. So it's uh, one of the most seismically active countries in the world. So there, on average, um, we have like um, 6.9 intensity earthquakes uh, with a death toll of uh, 89,000 uh, in injuries of more than 300,000 in the last two decades. So it is really a hot issue in not only in Pakistan, but all across the world. Uh, similarly, the infrastructural damages, um, they were worth $24 billion uh, is estimated uh, in the last earthquake. Next, please. So um, how the earthquake works. Um, so in order to build an early warning system for an earthquake, first we have to understand its mechanics. So in a nutshell, um, the, when an earthquake occurs, so it basically occurs in several phases. So first, um, the so-called body waves, they are released, uh, which are further divided into uh, two types. Um, we call them the primary waves, they are the P waves. So they are, um, by nature, they are longitudinal. And then we have uh, secondary waves, uh, the so-called transverse waves. Um, after these uh, two waves, uh, a third wave of the same event, uh, a, a group of waves that propagates, and that's called the surface waves. Uh, and after the surface waves, um, 
we have the so-called um, seismic coda waves are the aftershocks. But one event uh, basically uh, consists of the primary waves, secondary waves, and the surface waves. Uh, next, please. So um, each of these waves, they have different uh, level of severity or they have uh, different um, sort of contribution in the destruction. So for example, the P waves, um, they are least destructive, uh, which are released first. Um, and then we have the S waves, so they are uh, relatively more destructive. And the most destructive uh, are the surface waves. And so as you can see in the, this uh, animation, um, so the P waves and the S waves, they are subsurface uh, waves. So basically they uh, travel um, uh, through uh, the, uh, under the surface of Earth, uh, but the surface waves, they travel over the surface of Earth. Next, please. Um, so where is the opportunity in Earth uh, for us to develop an earthquake early warning system? So, of course, we can um, monitor uh, these waves and um, somehow uh, develop a system around that. So, for example, uh, if we are able to detect the P wave near the epicenter, and inform other regions about the arrival of the wave. So that, that's also a possibility because these waves uh, usually travel uh, slower than uh, the communication uh, speed that we have nowadays, for example, in the form of uh, telecommunication. Similarly, uh, if we are able to detect S wave near the epicenter, then we can inform other regions about the arrival of S wave. Um, and um, the, these P waves, um, since these are generated first, uh, they, they are generated before the S waves. Uh, and the interesting thing is that the P waves travel faster than the S waves due to their uh, nature. So that's also an opportunity for us uh, that if uh, somehow we are able to um, detect the P waves and we are able to predict the S waves from the P waves, uh, then we can have sufficient time um, for some notion of sufficiency. Of course, the event has already generated. Um, so if we have some time and we can use the time, then we can um, uh, save uh, lives and uh, uh, other um, properties to some extent. Um, so the idea is that um, the one that uh, the, the third one that if we are able to uh, predict S waves uh, based on the information uh, in the P wave, uh, so that is um, uh, that is the possibility that gives us uh, maximum time. Next, please. So. Uh, here is uh, a typical um, earthquake event uh, that was occurred in uh, August uh, on August 10, 2011, um, somewhere in Pakistan. Um, so the the region was central Balochistan, which is on uh, border with uh, Iran. Um, so we can see that uh, the the table on the right side. Uh, it basically shows the arrival time of uh, the same event, which was like uh, sensed or noted um, in different regions in Pakistan. So we can see that uh, on the left hand side, uh, we can see that um, the time at which this event occurred was um, 00, 00 hour 53 minutes and 27 seconds. And then uh, when it arrived, um, the first station, which was located in Quetta, so they took it uh, 47 seconds. And then uh, the next station, uh, which um, like uh, sensed this event, that was Umar Court, and that was like um, after um, one minute and eight seconds. Similarly, uh, Chetral, uh, which was like the third station, uh, but of course it's quite far away. Uh, you can see that it's like more than 1,000 kilometers away from the event, uh, the origin of the event, the origin of the earthquake event. And 
it like it was like propagated there um, so the event was sensed after uh, 2 minutes and 31 seconds so it's um, uh, quite a long time uh, that we can cache and uh, um, through uh, the development of an early warning system next please yeah so this is um, a typical um, uh, scenario of um, that we have developed from the previous uh, event and so we can see that um, we have on the left side we have uh, epicenter in central balochistan and uh, when this event arrived in Quetta on the left side, um, so it traveled uh, 320 kilometers. So that, is, that was the P wave. So the P wave um, arrived in 40 second, second, uh, 47 seconds, uh, in the, uh, it, uh, which was detected at the first station. Um, then on the right side at the top, uh, the same event, uh, the same P wave, uh, it was uh, in Chetral, it was um, detected after two minutes and 31 seconds, which is at a distance of um, 1,187 kilometers. So now uh, the idea is that if... Uh, this this the station at Quetta when it uh, which is the closest in this case, um, if it, when it detects this P wave and through a telecommunication line it can uh, tell the central station which is in Islamabad, so if it can tell uh, there that I have detected a P wave. Um, then Islamabad can easily uh, tell Chetral, uh, which is on the top right through telecommunication line, that some activity um, related to earthquake has been detected. And we can see that ideally the telecommunication lines can take uh, in less than a second um, to transmit this message uh, to the central station and from the central station to the far off uh, region. Uh, which will be uh, in this case is Chetral, which will be uh, like experiencing um, the earthquake event in a while. So we can see that um, the time alert signal will take uh, to reach from epicenter to Chetral station in uh, 47.003258 seconds, which is basically um, the, the main time is uh, basically from the epicenter to the first station, and the rest is just less than one second. Um, and then the time that P wave will take to reach from epicenter to Chitral station is 151 seconds. So it means that um, just uh, like through a bake of the envelope calculation, uh, we have a time of 151 seconds minus 47 seconds uh, to do some evacuation activities, uh, which can be designed for such time frame. Next, please. Um, so this is a map of uh, Pakistan seismic network. There, uh, when we were like um, conducting this project, so there were um, around 32 sensor stations. Some of them were, of course, uh, not functioning, uh, but still they are planning to install more stations in order to make the network more robust and uh, more useful. So uh, on the right-hand side, what we see is a typical uh, seismic sensor. Uh, this is called a uh, Gural uh, sen sensor. So it can uh, sense uh, seismic waves. Uh, then there are different varieties of these sensors. Uh, some are designed for, uh, some are more sensitive, so they can uh, uh, sense um, the earthquake events from longer distances, for, for example, across countries. And then there are some which are like for shorter distances. Next, please. So uh, the goal of the project was um, to um, monitor the earthquake signals uh, for early detection, uh, which is uh, so to detect the P waves, the S waves, and the noise. So of course, uh, since these sensors um, function are operate around the clock, so the challenge is um, uh, to come up with a technique um, for phase classification. So uh, there, there, there is, uh, of course, there are some uh, existing uh, systems which are 
like used for uh, phase classification, uh, but those systems um, somehow uh, they need uh, human involvement in order to um, um, come up with the final information. So the idea was uh, to come up with um, uh, a phase classification system that can automatically uh, differentiate between uh, the P wave, the S wave, and uh, the noise, because most of the time there will be no event and it will only be noise on uh, the channel. Uh, similarly, the next part was early prediction. So um, S wave prediction using uh, P wave analysis. So once uh, we have done the phase classification, that is, uh, once we know that this is P wave or S wave or noise, so the next stage is that um, yeah, we should be able that once we detect a P wave, so we should have a system uh, that can predict uh, the S wave that has not yet arrived. So uh, within the S wave, uh, we are more in, uh, we were interested in the arrival time of the P wave uh, because that will um, um, that will tell us like how much time it is uh, to for the P waves, which are the more uh, destructive waves, uh, to arrive in the magnitude of the P waves. So, uh, because uh, once we know about the magnitude of the P wave, that can give us an indication on the intensity of the earthquake. And uh, developing standard earthquake catalog, because uh, when we were um, starting the project, so at that time, um, they didn't have uh, their data in some standard form. So the data was like being stored in different forms and also the historical data they were, uh, that was uh, stored using different technologies. So the idea was to um, collect all the data and um, come up with a standard earthquake catalog, uh, which uh, will not only be used in this project, but which can also be used uh, later on um, by geo, uh, 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 geoscientists um, or geologists, because they also need this data. Next, please. So uh, here is a spectrum of solutions for earthquake early warning systems. So there, there are uh, solutions out there, uh, but uh, they are still in uh, these solutions, um, is especially based on uh, artificial intelligence uh, and IoT. They are still in um, uh, testing phases. So. Of course, there are some solutions which have been uh, deployed in the field, uh, but overall, um, due to the tough nature of this problem, um, still there are different solutions in different phases. So uh, there are IoT-based solutions, and then there are uh, data-driven solutions. Next, Next, please. So in the IoT-based solutions, um, the idea is that um, there is uh, this station or sensor and it senses um, or detects the P wave near the epicenter and inform other regions through telecommunication lines. Similarly, it detects the S wave uh, near the epicenter and inform other regions. So, and based on those information, um, the decisions can be taken about uh, the arrival of the um, earthquake event at um, the destination. Next, please. So, do we use artificial intelligence in this approach? Um, yes, we do use artificial intelligence in this approach, although it's based on, uh, uh, it's primarily based on IoT, but we still use uh, artificial intelligence in this approach. Next, please. So phase classification, as uh, I discussed earlier, uh, phase classification um, can be done to, through artificial intelligence. And we try to come up with uh, a solution. Uh, of course, there are other solutions available as well, uh, but um, those solutions, um, they had used different approaches and uh, different data sets. Uh, what we were interested in is to come up with a more advanced form um, of AI-based solution for phase classification using the local data. Uh, so uh, in this uh, approach, um, 
what we tried is to come up with phase classification uh, model, uh, which can uh, differentiate between the primary wave, secondary wave, and the noise. Next, please. Uh, then in the data-driven based uh, earthquake early warning systems, um, the main focus uh, is on predicting S wave uh, or the secondary waves from P waves from the primary waves. Um, and based on that, uh, we uh, have to inform other regions. Next, please. So where do we use AI in this approach? Uh, next, please. Um, so we use, um, of course, um, we also use uh, phase classification in this approach. So that's uh, the one which is common with IoT-based solutions, that is um, differentiating between primary, secondary waves and noise. And the other one is prediction of uh, S waves from P waves. Uh, as we discussed earlier, um, so it should be like, um, when an S wave will arrive, and what will be uh, the magnitude of that S wave. So these are the two um, um, parameters that um, uh, we wanted to predict. Next, please. So um, we adopted a hybrid approach. Um, so our solution consists of um, idea from IoT-based solutions and also the data-driven. So, uh, we uh, do this uh, seismic uh, seismic phase detection and classification and uh, seismic uh, event prediction with uh, like the prediction of its arrival time and also uh, the prediction of the magnitude. Next, please. Yeah, so uh, as it is evident that um, in almost every um, application of artificial intelligence, which is based on machine learning or deep learning, uh, we need data. So as part of our project, um, we had to collect uh, the data for our uh, AI models because this data, um, the, the format in which or the, the granular level at which this data uh, was needed for our um, uh, models uh, to train our models, uh, it was not available. Uh, of course, it was there, but it was sparse and there were errors and there were other issues related to GPS and uh, many other issues that we had to um, cope with. So for that, um, we had to collaborate with uh, Pakistan uh, Med Department and then we um, gathered data, uh, acquired data from them. Uh, we visited different stations all over Pakistan. So somehow during the project, uh, we traveled for more than uh, 10,000 kilometers, uh, traveling back and forth in different uh, st uh, to different stations, collecting data from there and uh, trying to clean the data. Uh, so after that, we annotated the data and standardized it based on uh, some protocols which were provided by um, uh, some geologists who were also part of our team. And then we came up with the catalog. Next, please. So uh, uh, we developed a basic uh, earthquake early warning system based on our uh, machine learning and deep learning models. Um, we also tested it uh, in our lab. Uh, so it's uh, next, please. Uh, can you please go to the previous slide? Yes. So uh, this is a typical uh, technology readiness level. So there are um, nine levels. So when uh, a new technology is developed, so it starts from basic, um, uh, principles uh, which are observed and then uh, technology concept formulation and then experimental proof of concept, uh, technology validation in lab. So basically uh, we developed this um, product at uh, technology validation in lab level, which is the technology readiness level um, four. And in the next phase, uh, this will be deployed in the field um, so that it will be tested in the field. And of course, we are uh, at the time, uh, we were anticipating um, to face many issues. Uh, 
but at least we were ready for that. Uh, next, please. So this is a demonstration of um, a typical system uh, for earthquake early warning. So you see there are these uh, different stations and this earthquake occurs, the primary waves, they are detected by uh, the telecommunicate, uh, they, they are detected by the sensors and transmitted through the telecommunication system. And uh, when the S wave arrives, so uh, the, the regions are already informed and they can take some remedial actions. Next, please. So this is um, a general architecture of the system. Um, so uh, in our project, we also engaged undergraduate students. Uh, so this um, architecture was drawn by um, undergraduate final year project students. So the idea was to um, share with you that how um, we engage students in uh, real world projects. Um, so uh, th they developed a web-based interface to this system. So uh, this was um, uh, the, the architecture of the main system. On the left-hand side in the green box, that, re that uh, represents um, the sensor station uh, where the station, uh, where the sensors are uh, placed. And uh, there we had to install our uh, device, the so-called edge device. Um, which takes data uh, or the real-time input from the sensors. Uh, and then um, in that edge device, our um, AI-based models for phase classification, they are installed and they decide whether um, the uh, incoming signal is noise or primary wave or secondary wave. So once it detects something, for example, P wave or um, uh, as a S wave, so that is then uh, transmitted uh, to a central station, um, our central server, and then uh, on the right hand side, and the central server then um, um, generates some alerts, for example, uh, to the mobile phones, and then uh, they're not only to the end user but also to the authority. So that's uh, where. Um, the application logic or the business logic can be implemented. Next, please. So um, the main um, goal, the technical goal um, uh, in such projects is uh, that the detection accuracy should be improved. So basically uh, we have these uh, four um, notions, the true positive, uh, which means that if there is an event of interest, so our system should be able to detect it. Uh, similarly, the false positive, so which means, uh, so of course we, um, we aim for improving uh, the number of true positives, uh, that is the detection accuracy. A false positive are basically false alarms. So sometimes um, it, it is quite possible for the AI models uh, that it is um, the, the incoming signal um, is basically a noise and uh, the model it uh, alarms, generates an alarm for P wave or S wave. So the goal is to keep the false positives uh, low. Uh, similarly, the true negative, so for example, if it is uh, a noise, then the system should uh, classify it correctly as noise. Um, and uh, sometimes like um, uh, the false negatives, which means that there is an event of interest, for example, some P wave or some uh, S wave, but the AI model or system uh, falsely negated for and considers it is um, a, a noise. So since um, these systems are uh, earthquake early warning systems, they are real time and they are very critical. So we have to be very careful about um, the detection accuracy. Next, please. So this was um, a publication that uh, still is under submission to a journal, um, Convo EQ. 
a convolutional neural network for earthquake phase classification using short-term frequency transform. So the main idea was that uh, we aimed for a decentralized design uh, where uh, like the AI models, they, um, they were trained on uh, station level data instead of data from uh, all um, stations. Uh, because when um, we keep it decentralized, um, so uh, it, the, the idea was that it should be uh, more accurate because um, the, the uh, earthquake data, it also depends on the surrounding geology of the earth. So if we keep it like local, and make the decisions locally. So the idea was that it should be more accurate. Um, and also it is lightweight, uh, so suitable for implementation on edge devices. Uh, and also the system can be um, somehow through the notions of um, reinforcement learning, uh, these systems can learn with the passage of time as well without re-modeling uh, re them. Uh, retraining those models. Next, please. So this is the architecture, the proposed architecture of our system. Of course, I will not be going into the details of this system. Um, well, if you make it to the constructed university, so someday it is quite possible that we discuss it here in our classroom. Next, please. Um, so this is the flow chart, uh, which also shows like the pre-processing and the implementation of our um, uh, model. So uh, what, uh, what is of particular interest is that uh, we can see that during um, the pre-processing, uh, we use this uh, Fourier transformation in order to transform the data from uh, time domain to frequency domain. And there were even more complex calculations uh, before um, uh, inputting, or, uh, uh, inputting our data for uh, training or models. So it's again an alarm that um, in some uh, or in most of the cases in uh, real time, uh, real world applications of artificial intelligence, uh, we not only need a programming languages, expertise in programming languages, but we also need um, core concepts from mathematics in order to pre-process our data. Next, please. Um, so of course, the, uh, we are not uh, going into the details of the results, but um, the accuracy of our system, uh, it was up to 99% uh, on unseen data for a single station, which was our primary aim. So uh, of course it does not mean that for every situation it will give 99% result, but um, we saw like for different chunks of data, we saw um, accuracy up to 99%. Uh, and we still think it's, uh, it's very challenging uh, to come up with um, a stable accurate system up to this accuracy level. Uh, the total processing time for the edge device, which uh, will basically be running our models um, near the station, so that was uh, around 30, 30 milliseconds. Um, so it's it's um, quite faster than the existing solutions um, reported in the literature. Uh, similarly, um, the overall accuracy for multi-station, like the models that we trained on data from multiple stations, uh, it was up to 96%. Uh, um, but so it somehow um, justified our initial hypothesis. Uh, but um, we don't say that it's the final word because it's really data dependent. So um, all our um, computations are... Uh, these uh, facts and, and figures, they are within the boundary of the data that we had. Next, please. So the overall conclusion is that the design that we came up with is um, it's quite promising and uh, for future smart earthquake early warning systems. 
uh, and we hope to work on it further to improve it in order to solve this uh, long-standing problem of uh, earthquake early warning systems. Thank you. Thank you so much, Suhail. Yeah, it's interesting uh, usage uh, of technologies for earthquakes and detection of earthquakes. And right now I would like to introduce uh, Alexander Amenchenko, who is Dean of School of Computer Science and Engineering at Constructor University. And Alexander will tell more about Pageware in Software Data and Technology Program. Alexander, please join us. Thank you very much, uh, dear colleagues. Uh, as you know, uh, this program is one of the uh, maybe the most expected programs uh, if we are talking about strong students, talented students, uh, because the main goal for us uh, was to invite the best students all around the world and to learn uh, and to, to give them the opportunity to learn more about modern technologies, more modern uh, approaches to data science, deep learning, machine learning, software engineering, programming languages, algorithms and data structures, and other very important topics. Could we look at another slide? Yeah, that's uh, uh, a very short description of our program. As you could see, uh, our bachelor program uh, lasts three years. Uh, we've got so-called 4C uh, structure for every program in our university. What does it mean? It means that we've got three years. Uh, the first year uh, is a, a choice year. So uh, our students uh, could choose First of all, programs, of course, they could choose uh, uh, what kind of uh, minors uh, uh, they want to, to, to learn. Uh, we've got uh, lots of additional topics uh, which uh, you could learn during uh, uh, the education process in our university. And uh, of course, uh, you you have to uh, you have the opportunity to learn some basic uh, courses, basic models. If we are talking about um, our particular program, for example, for us it's a really important uh, topic is programming languages. So we are starting from programming in Python and C plus plus. Next course, very important for us also, is development in GVM languages. Mostly we are talking about Java and Kotlin. Kotlin is the language which was invented uh, more than 10 years ago by our colleagues from JetBrains. Also, uh, we are really serious in uh, algorithms and data structures. It's really important topic for uh, all students who are going to apply for um, uh, internships uh, and who, is go who are going to work for the best IT companies. Of course, when you try to have a place to these companies, you need to demonstrate your skills in algorithms, first of all, in data structures. There are lots of questions about uh, this uh, from this uh, particular area. So our goal is to prepare you for that. So we've got core algorithms and data structures and then advanced algorithms and data structures. Also, uh, we've got several very important mathematical courses. Right now it's analysis, matrix, algebra, and advanced calculus. We are thinking about changing uh, and um, we are thinking about replacing analysis to a special course like discrete mathematics for uh, computer science, because it's really important for you also to know some elements of discrete mathematics, mathematical logic, combinatorics, graph theory, discrete probability, uh, and other uh, very important things. Uh, then, of course, 
uh, ah, the next year it's the second year uh, and it's another C, it's core. So uh, core uh, uh, models for courses like computer architecture, functional programming, data analysis, um, operating systems, probability and random processes, uh, software engineering, software design, discrete mathematics, artificial intelligence, machine learning, databases. Uh, all topics are really important for us. Uh, we have also some sort of a three tracks. The first one is machine learning track. The second one is a software engineering track. And the third one is programming language track. So uh, during this uh, particular year, second year, you could choose. You could choose between these uh, three tracks. And you could choose, for example, to, to study, to learn uh, uh, functional programming or data analysis. You could choose between discrete mathematics and uh, artificial, artificial intelligence and, and so on. And of course, if we are talking about third year, uh, it's another C, it's career. So you got some internship. It's really important for us, especially for our partners. Uh, you could try to uh, apply for internship uh, in JetBrains, uh, for JetBrains and for other IT companies here. Also, we've got lots of uh, special models like uh, deep learning, NLP, uh, compilers, uh, um, other courses. And uh, of course, you've got uh, bachelor thesis and uh, research seminars. Plus, we've got so-called so constructor track. It's uh, another C uh, constructor track. And uh, this track allows you to uh, know more about uh, some uh, mathematical things like uh, matrix algebra, calculus, probability, mathematical statistics, uh, data analytics. We've got several other very important topics uh, like complex problem solving, uh, leadership, agile, uh, maybe soft skills. It's really important for those who are going to work uh, uh, in uh, modern IT companies. Uh, they need such soft skills. Plus, we've got logic, uh, causation, correlation. And of course, we've got German for those who are going to stay in Germany after they uh, study and uh, work for some German companies. It's really important. Uh, well, it's not uh, important only for those who are going to stay in Germany, but for maybe for others, because you're going to stay for three years and you need at least to understand something. Uh, and maybe uh, at least to read some notes and to, 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 to understand what kind of food you are going to buy in supermarkets and so on. So uh, that's uh, our model. Uh, uh, next slide, please. Yes, uh, as I said, uh, we have uh, three specializations, machine learning, software development, programming languages. Right now, you, uh, you could see uh, several elective courses. Uh, Fortunately, uh, we uh, right now we have uh, maybe uh, more plans. Uh, we are going to increase the number of such uh, electives, and especially in the field of machine learning and uh, data science. Uh, just because uh, we right now we have. Um, we, man we, man we managed to hire uh, several very uh, interesting and uh, very uh, strong professors in this area. For example, uh, we just uh, signed a contract with Dmitry Vetrov, one of the best 
uh, specialist in theoretical machine learning. Also, we sign a contract with Marcus Wenzel, who is a really great specialist in applying machine learning to medicine and to biology and other things. So hopefully we will increase the number of uh, these elective courses. And of course, you will have the opportunity to continue your education uh, uh, in our master degree program. Um, and hopefully we will uh, give you all necessary uh, I'll say uh, uh, knowledge uh, to apply for this master degree program too, as well as other master degree pro programs all around the world. So hopefully we could uh, help you uh, uh, to be a, a really great programmers, great, great software engineers or data scientists. Maybe right now it's the most popular area uh, comparing with other, uh, I don't know, specializations. Maybe that's uh, how we are going to build our, you know, our future talking about a uh, new uh, artificial intelligence tools like ChatGPT and other things. So uh, we really hope that you could come to us, that you could uh, study with us, you could learn something from us. And uh, I really uh, like to present our program and I, uh, I, 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 I invite you to our university. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Alexander, uh, for diving deep to the program and its details and courses and what will wait all of our students during studies of three years of our bachelor program. And right now, I would like to explain more about admission process, financing options and available scholarships. So it will be not a long part because we will have one more presentation later. And as, as I mentioned, this will be a series of webinars. Yeah. So far, you can ask your questions in chat in YouTube to Alexandra Melchenko and to Suhail because this is a unique opportunity to ask these questions to them. Please feel free to text these questions. Also, at the end of uh, the webinar, we will provide a QR code and link to uh, uh, WhatsApp chat where we will send all the needed information about the program admission process and we will also be able to reply on all your questions. So let's move a little bit like deeper to Constructor University in general and its admission process. Yeah, so uh, Constructor University is a research-oriented university located in northern Germany, critics from Bremen. Yeah, and we are number one private university in the country. Our campus is the home of a truly international community. We have about 1,600 students from 120 countries, and it makes us number one international university in Europe and one of the most international universities in the world as well. So our classes are small and interactive. Professors and lecturers provide uh, individual approach to all of the students, and especially for this program, Bachelor in Software, Data and Technology, we also have uh, our colleagues from JetBrains who works all the time with the students. So, uh, on the photos you can see our campus and the room of uh, the campus. We have uh, four different residential colleges where all of our students live and all of our first year undergraduate students live on campus. And uh, every residential co uh, college has its own dining room, study areas, common and group meeting rooms. Um, also, additional to excellence of academic education, we also provide different student activities uh, opportunities. There are 60 student clubs, even more than this, in different topics, music, sports, VR clubs, and so on, and more than 100 events which students do on campus in general. So, a little bit like about our university. Yeah, let's go to the next slide. And here uh, I will explain how to apply. Just very uh, like simple steps how to come to university. You need to apply through our 
а портал apply constructor university apply dot constructor dot university uh, there you will need to enter all the information about like all uh, yourself yeah and also uh, to upload some of the documents very straightforward and simple process the second step that you will be wait for your admission decision. If something needed, admission team will contact you and ask you more questions uh, or for more documents. Uh, so um, at this stage, uh, we are checking uh, your documents for eligibility to study at university at, and in Germany in general as well, yeah, because there are some uh, rules uh, which applies to university. Uh, so the first step, as soon as you receive admission decision, you need to pay enrollment deposit of 500 euros and to book your seat in this program, Bachelor of Software, Data and Technology, for yourself for the next intake. Yeah. Uh, as soon as you receive admission decision again, you need to start working on your visa process in case it's needed. Yeah. And at the end of August, to come to campus, and to start your studies, this is the last six step, and we are looking forward to see you on campus. Uh, so let me tell a little bit more about the first step and how to apply, because this is our call to action to you. If you would like to join our bachelor program, uh, your goal uh, to apply.constructor.university, this is QR code, uh, which is uh, uh, sending you to this website or admission portal. Uh, again, you need to send information about yourself, there will be questions, uh, personal questions, and to upload uh, necessary documents. This is national ID or passport, your transcripts for the two, three last years of your studies and high school, then educational history form, also English test result, TOEFL, IELTS or Duolingo, uh, and if you have SAT test as well. Yeah, if you don't have a SAT test, then it's fine. You can submit your application without it. And in case it's ne necessary, admission team will uh, contact you and explain uh, the next steps how to pass SAT. So SAT is needed not for all the students, depending on high school students. And this is regulated by German law. So um, very simple. I hope you already used QR code and we will send this link one more time to uh, the chats and to follow up after this webinar. So let's move to the next uh, slides. And here I will explain you about all the financial uh, options. Can we move to the next slide, please? Yeah. Um, our education costs and tuition fees are 20,000 euros per year. Room and board to live on campus, as I already mentioned, and you see some photos also in the background, uh, winter campus. Uh, room and board costs uh, 8,000 euros uh, per year. It includes everything, room and also meal plan. Uh, usually all our students, they receive such a card where all the money which were for meal plan is in there and you can pay on campus with this card. Uh, additional expenses are also needed. This is semester ticket for the uh, trains in Germany, medical insurance. It's around 1,500 euros. It's also on our website. You can check the detailed explanation for what is money is needed. So this is uh, how much uh, our education costs uh, uh, on campus. And this is per year. Yeah, But we also have good scholarships, which uh, every student can get or try uh, yourself to get the scholarship. The first one everyone is considered for, this is Academic Achievement Scholarship, and it will be provided to all the students depending on your GPA uh, of high school uh, grades you have received. Yeah. Uh, it can be up to 8,000 euros can be four, six, and eight, depending on your GPA. And when you receive your admission decision, you will get this information. The second available scholarship is tuition deferral. Also, there is um, information about it, like in more details what it is, but uh, like shortly to tell, uh, you can like, Com brain capital company can cover some of tuitions uh, for your studies during your studies but when you graduate and start working you will pay back this uh, tuition and with such great jobs IT jobs it will be quite easy to pay uh, these amounts back and the third very unique scholarship is scholarship uh, with JetBrains 
Why it's very unique, it's applied only for bachelor in software, data, and technology. It doesn't apply to any other program. Uh, and let's move to the next uh, slide. Uh, JetPress uh, scholarship covers tuitions, room and board, uh, fees, and also pocket money for the first year students. So it's very unique. You don't need any other additional money if you come and if you get the scholarship. And how to get the scholarship? There are two steps. The first one is to go through test successfully. And the second one, if you went through the test successfully, you will be invited for interview with JetBrains representatives and constructive university representatives, and you will get your decision. Yeah. So these steps will be in two waves. And everyone who apply for the program, uh, Bachelor in Software, Data and Technology, will have opportunity to go through these stages if you apply by May 1st. So this is very important information. Everyone who applied to the program before March 1st, they will get linked to the test on the 1st of March. You will have seven days to solve test. It will be with programming and math tasks. And we'll have more details about the test. And also there will be session how to prepare yourself for the test. And uh, you will be able to see tasks from the previous years. Uh, you will have one week, yeah, if you, go successfully through the test, you will be invited for the interview. And one week after the interview, you will receive a scholarship offer in case if it's successful as well. If you don't get your scholarship, you can join a university with regular admission decision with other scholarships, which I already mentioned. This is a scholarship by DP and tuition referral. So it's still possible. Yeah, please try, go through the test interview and try to get this JetBrains scholarship. The first wave is March 1st and the second wave, everyone who applied uh, to university from March 1st to May 1st will get the link for the test on May 1st and will be considered for the scholarship also. Um, yeah, so another option uh, to get JetBrains scholarship, uh, we have competition. Uh, constructor open cup it was uh, uh, we held this competition last year as well um, and students uh, can join this competition and in case if you perform well there you can get the opportunity to get scholarship and you will be recommended to apply and to you will be invited to the interview as well this competition is planned for february 8 we will uh, provide more details about competition and what is very important for it uh, you can try yourself in both options. You can first try uh, to get scholarship through competition, construct Open Cup. Yeah, and if you like uh, didn't win this competition, you still can go through the test. So both options are possible. And this is also very, very important. But again, we'll have more information about this in the next sessions. And also uh, starting from January 19th, we will have open hours where uh, I will be on the sessions, JetBrains representatives will be uh, on the sessions to reply just on your questions regarding admission process, program, and so on. Uh, we will provide this to the chat as well. And let's move to the next um, um, slide. Uh, can we move to the next one with QR code, just, just in case right now? Yeah, this is QR code for our WhatsApp group. Uh, please use it right now. Uh, join our group. We'll send all the links. We'll send recording to our webinar. Uh, we'll reply to your questions there as well. Uh, join right now uh, through this QR code. While you are joining, I would like to open our Q&A section with our speakers, with Suhail and with Alexandra Melchenko. We still have, and you still have um, uh, a good chance. Uh, to ask your questions to the Dean of Computer Science, Alexandra Melchenko, to ask more about the program and also to Suhail about the topic he presented um, about impl implementation of artificial intelligence uh, to earthquake situations. Yeah, so let me go to the chat and to see what questions, uh, questions we have. Uh, yeah, one moment. Yeah, uh, Alexander, are you here? 
Okay. Maybe, maybe Suhaila will address this question to you, Alexander uh, also uh, will join. So what are the career opportunities after getting bachelor in software, data and technology? Career opportunities after this program? Alexander, yeah. That's a question for me or? <laughs> yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, actually, uh... As, as I said before, maybe it's right now the most popular area uh, if we compare with physicists or mathematicians or even programmers, because if we are talking about data science, machine learning, it's some sort of our future and uh, everybody right now wants to be a software and not software even developer, but uh, sometimes data engineer or machine learner or something like this. And we give this opportunity because uh, it's our main specialization, and we are proud to have uh, excellent professors in this area. And with these skills, you could uh, work for uh, IT companies, for banks, for uh, uh, for any uh, I don't know for any company which needs a data, which deal with data, which need to predict something, to analyze something, and other things. Even uh, our colleagues from psycholo psychology, chemistry, physics, uh, mathematics, they need this specialist and you could build your research career, you could be a professor somewhere, or you could uh, get lots of money as a data uh, scientist, for example. Thank you so much, Alexander. I think the second question we received is also for you, is uh, how I can choose supervisor for my bachelor thesis? Yeah, can you please explain more yeah, about this? Uh, we, we've got, uh, first of all, we've got our professors and uh, usually our professors uh, could do it and do it. Uh, for... And also, uh, We've got our partners, first of all, JetBrains, and uh, there, are there are lots of opportunities for our students to work with our colleagues from JetBrains because they are ready to support us. To support us. Several JetBrains colleagues, they are adjunct professors in our university, so they could be our uh, your uh, scientific supervisor and you could uh, prepare your bachelor thesis with them also. <clears throat> uh, thank you so much, Alexander. Uh, so, uh, dear students, if you have questions regarding the topic to Suhail, please also ask these questions. Yeah, because I see there are many questions about scholarships, which we can reply later. You will be with us uh, in all the chats, yeah, but not with Suhail, so we're not with Alexander. Please ask questions to them. Uh, uh, meanwhile, I will reply to questions regarding scholarship. And the first one is, is there a JetBrains scholarship for students after the first year at another university? Yes, it's possible to apply after the first year of your studies in another university, but you need to, uh, to note that you will apply again for the first year of studies. Yeah, so it's not possible to transfer with JetBrains scholarship to uh, the intake with which we already started, which already started this fall, fall 2023. Yeah, so if you would like to start in fall 2024, you will start from the first year, but it's possible, sure. Then one more question. Uh, and Natalia from Georgia, can I apply for JetBrain scholarship before March 1st and send my SAT results afterwards? Yes, it's possible. You can submit your application without SAT results by March 1st. First, go through the application, then to submit SAT a little bit later. It's totally fine because we understand that SAT takes more time to go through it and to pass this exam. Now, we even have students who pass SAT exams uh, later during the first year, uh, first semester of studies before uh, exam session, but it's needed. Yeah, the most important to understand it's needed. Uh, the next question, what if we don't have all the documents in English? Can the university translate them? Uh, unfortunately, we cannot translate documents for all the students. So uh, we have, we can take 
from 126 countries and we cannot translate all the documents from all of the students. So please make a translation by yourself to English or to German and to submit your documents already in these languages. So not any other languages. Uh, it's also written on our website if you would like to see more information. Yeah, like there it's everything about every document and that it, they should be translated. Okay. Uh, so, um, okay, um, one more question, Alexander, I think uh, to you, um, what makes a uh, program with JetBrains software data and technology program special and unique out of all other constructed university programs? Um, uh, our program maybe is uh, a little bit similar to uh, another program, computer science program. It's another very popular program right now, but only in our program we've got uh, uh, some sort of uh, advanced courses. First of all, in algorithms and data structure, in, in, in data structures, in programming languages. Also, we have a very, very strong mathema uh, uh, mathematical background uh, and uh, our students uh, needs, need to have such a background. Plus, we've got excellent additional courses like uh, our specialization courses. Plus, uh, lots of our students, they choose this machine learning track and this track I suppose should be one of the uh, most important and most popular uh, uh, elective courses, not only for our students, but also for students from our uh, programs, from our and other programs like computer science program or robotics or even electrical engineers. They uh, usually try to choose these elective courses from our program. Uh, thank you so much. Yeah, we received one more question about uh, JetBrains scholarship and I think I will reply on it. What about JetBrains scholarship after first year? Should I pay by myself from the second year? Uh, no, you don't need to pay because JetBrains scholarship covers uh, tuition fees, uh, also room and board for all three years. Only pocket money will be additionally added for you during your first year of studies. Yeah, but on the second, third year, you also can start working to get additional money. But in general, everything like uh, situations and uh, coverage of room and board is enough to study for you. Yeah, uh, I hope I replied on this question. One moment, I will check. And you have the last chance to ask a question today because uh, we are limited in time. Yeah, and I think one more question to Suhail, to Suhail about your topic. Uh, why did you use um, specifically convolutional neural networks for your task, not other types of neural networks? <laughs> so that's a very good question. Um, of course, um, th there were other possibilities as well. Um, we uh, took start from the basic solutions. Um, we tried some other solutions, as, uh, some other approaches as well. Uh, but as I mentioned uh, during the presentation, that um, uh, it, it also depends on the availability of data. Uh, that's the first thing. How much data do you have? And the second thing is the data patterns. So like usually um, when we train uh, systems, uh, on data when we train our models. So they don't have that real-time uh, element. So uh, in for these uh, models, um, we had to take care of that this um, event is very rare, like it occurs after a long time. So that was also um, one consideration uh, that we had to um, take start from the beginning. So we still have to explore uh, other models. Uh, of course, I'm uh, not part of it right now, uh, but my other colleagues, they are working on it. Uh, they are trying to collect more data and also to uh, apply 
more models, but still we want to understand this uh, problem. So that's why we took start from uh, the basics. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So Highland, one more question we received for you. How much data did you, did you have for this uh, work? Um, yeah, so basically the uh, data that we uh, collected, uh, it was the events were basically in uh, hundreds, right? Um, we also had uh, like data, which is um, the, the data sets which are internationally available. Um, so, but again, um, like the sometimes there are inherent biases in the data in the sense that uh, either the events are like less than the four magnitude uh, in which we were not much interested in the start because those events are, uh, the, the, are like earthquakes of magnitude four or even five. Um, of course, five can be dangerous, but we were still interested in uh, those bigger events. So yeah, there, there is like a data set, uh, different data sets available um, from uh, open sources, uh, but uh, our own uh, data set, there was like in hundreds of events. Thank you so much, Sohail. So the last minute to ask your questions. Uh, and one one question, uh, probably Alexander, you can help me to reply on this. Are there plans for programs related to biology and bioinformatics? Uh, mm, that's a, good, a very good question. Actually, we've got uh, excellent uh, programs in, in the field of Molecule, molecular uh, biology and uh, cell biology in our university. You could look at our site. And uh, for these students, uh, it would be better to take several courses from our program as a minor and have some sort of additional skills to be about uh, inform uh, to in, in this area in this in the area of bioinformatics right now we haven't got a special track for bioinformatics but combining this program with uh, our programs in molecular biology and cell biology you could be an excellent uh, specialist in this area too Thank you. Thank you so much, Alexander. And the last question, uh, I think, on which we will reply is, uh, I'm now in a senior high uh, and it's my second year. Can I apply for the scholarship? So, uh, you have to graduate from your high school. I hope I understood your question correctly. So, sorry if I, I didn't. You can clarify this in the chat as well. So, you need to graduate from your high school and to get diploma and transcript. If you, at the last stage of graduating, yeah, you can apply anyway right now, even not having diploma, but just providing transcripts for the last two, three years. Yeah. But we expect that you graduate somewhere in June, July for sure, yeah, to start your education in fall 2024. And again, I will uh, remind to apply for scholarship, you need to apply to university, to apply.constructor.university uh, uh, application portal by May 1st. This is important. So those who applied by May 1st will get links to the tests and will have chance to get the Prince scholarship. Okay, uh, so we are in time. Uh, 6.30 in Germany right now. Uh, please use WhatsApp chat. Uh, our uh, WhatsApp chat, I see that some students joined the chat and will send more information. Thank you so much for being with us here today. We'll have recording of this session. You can share uh, information and recording to your friends. Uh, also to share a link to WhatsApp chat where we'll post more information on how to apply to our program, how to go smoothly through the process and get uh, that brain scholarship. Uh, thank you so much. Yeah, stay in touch and looking forward to see you in Bremen. Yeah, thank you. Bye-bye.